Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live with James Jacob Prash from Wellington, New Zealand. Jacob's out there speaking, and this is this week in Prophecies Update. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Wonderful to be with you. I'm in the Southern Hemisphere at the moment, but wherever you are, the Lord be with all of us. This week in prophecy, something we don't usually do is look at trends within the church. We usually begin with prophetic events in the Middle East and so forth. But this week, I'd like to look at a trend within the church. It's going ballistic on internet, on many websites, and many people are picking up on this, and we're getting questions concerning it. Uh, I'm certainly getting questions from people who want to know about this September 23rd hoax. Next year, which is now, we're starting now, we are going to get into the year, the Hebrew year on God's calendar is the year 5,717. Five is the number of grace. 777, I think you know, triple completion. May mean the completion of the age of grace. Also, we don't tend to write our years fully, neither do the Jews. They abbreviate it, so they don't usually say the five, because it's always five. Five starts with 5,000. So they drop that, so the year on their system is the year 777. I mean, if God is into numbers, and if He likes patterns and prophetic things, which He evidently does, it's going to be the year 777, starting now. The year of the Messiah according to the Jews. Now, unfortunately, for the Jews who don't yet believe the New Testament and that the Messiah came the first time, they're going to be looking for the wrong Messiah. They will momentarily put their faith and trust in a counterfeit Messiah. But we pray for them that the gospel will reach them. But they believe this coming year, this year that we're in, is the year for the Messiah to show himself. Revelation 12 says, Now a great sign. Everyone say great sign. We might say... No sign has been called great in the Bible. This is called great sign, mega sign. We might say this is the greatest sign because no other celestial sign has been given more attention and more detail. We gloss over it. We read it very quickly. We're not going to do it today. Let me show you why it's very important because the time may be very soon. Well, the time is definitely very soon for this to be fulfilled. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. This does not refer to a woman floating through the sky. The simplest, most literal interpretation of this is the constellation Virgo, which will have the sun at her head, the moon at her feet, and 12 stars, nine from the constellation Leo and a conjunction of Mercury, Mars, and Venus on her head that makes 12 stars on the 23rd of September, 2017. Remember that date. 23rd of September, 2017. You know, the best-selling book, The Harbinger, which means the warning of judgments, they're reappearing again. There's nine of them. But one of the ones that is reappearing is the understanding and the revelation of a biblical term called the Shemitah. Now, Rabbi Jonathan, what is the Shemitah? <clears throat> the Shemitah is an ancient mystery goes back over 3,000 years to Moses, Mount Sinai, yet it is affecting everything from 9-11 to the rise and fall of the economy, to the crashing of the stock market, to the rise and fall of nations, everything from World War I, World War II, what is happening right now, and what will happen. It is the most precise, mind-boggling, biblical mystery, and it's coming true now. Now, when you talked about it in your book, The Harbinger, did you have any idea that this would, would so affect us today in our everyday life? I mean, and how big it is. I knew it, I knew it was 
happening. I mean, at least in a certain period, but I had no idea that it, it, it didn't just happen then. It's been affecting us, every single one who's watching right now. It's affecting every life since the day we were born and the future. I had no idea until very recently how big it was. It's just, it's really mind blowing. Okay, let's just go start with basics. Yeah. What does the Shemitah mean? What does the word mean? The Shemitah l l means the release, but it can, or it could also mean, literally, it can also mean the fall or the collapse in Hebrew. It can also mean the shaking. And what it, what it is is this. In Mount Sinai, God gave this law to Israel. Every seventh year, you would have a Sabbath year, a year of rest. That rest was called the Shemitah. There was no sowing, no reaping of the land. And on the last day of the Shemitah, the, the day is called Elul 29 on the biblical calendar. On that last day, something unique happens. All credit is wiped away. All debt is wiped away. The financial accounts of the nation are wiped clean. Now, this was to be a blessing. But when Israel turned against God, the Shemitah comes back as a sign of judgment on a nation that is driving God out of its life. So this is where it affects us particularly today. So the thing is that the Shemitah affects, as you can see, the economy right away. It's, it, it's, today it would be a, a recession or a depression. I mean, and the 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 Wall Street it literally is the collapse of the of 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 our financial realm. So what we're going to see so is we're we're going to have a collapse that's not a blessing. We're going right. to have the judgment type of collapse. We have already seen it happen, and it's actually getting more specific. The last two shemitahs have been so exact, so precise since 9/11, and and we're coming up to another one as well. So what we're going to see, and this is what blew me away, is it it has been affecting everything in in our lives from really there's no end to it. It's amazing and it's precise down to the days, the hours, even the seconds. This article comes to us today from usapoliticstoday.com. The Trump effect stock market at a record high and this has never occurred in over one century. President-elect Donald Trump is going to be the best president ever as far as in my lifetime is concerned. Wall Street recognizes this as well as the stock market has, has its best numbers in over 100 years. The Trump stock market rally, as we like to call it, continues to shatter the record books, what we have seen since President-elect Donald Trump won the presidential election on November 8th has never occurred before. Out of 23 days since the election, the Dow has reached all-time closing highs 15 of those days. On the other five of these days, the Dow landed at its second highest close ever up to this date. We have made incredible progress. I don't think there's ever been a president elected who in this short period of time has done what we've done. The stock market has hit record numbers, as you know. And uh, there has been a, a tremendous surge of optimism in the business world. We've already announced it as a fiasco. It is another nonsense, like Y2K. It is another fraud, another crackpot foolishness, or another you know, crackpot stunt, like the Mark Biltz Blood Moons fiasco. These things are nonsense. September 23rd, with these constellations in Leo and Virgo, we are warned against astrology and scriptures. We're told not to consult the stars. Now, we can simply talk about them as constellations. That may be true. The scriptures do speak of Orion and the book of Job. However, where do you see it used predictively in scripture? Moreover, they're not the true constellations. It is 12 stars, but only nine stars show up in the constellations. Three of them are planets. The whole thing is a complete and utter nonsense. That is not the meaning of Revelation 12. As we've explained before, Revelation chapter 12 is a Pesher interpretation of Matthew's nativity narrative being the Pesher. The whole sequence of events lines up with what transpired in the birth of Jesus as recorded in Matthew. We have the sign in the heavens in Revelation 12, and then the nations will see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. Well, we had a sign when Jesus was born in the nativity. The dragon trying to kill the baby coming out of the woman 
parallels Herod trying to kill Jesus in anticipation of his birth. The man-child being rescued replays or recapitulates the rescue of Jesus to Egypt, the term for rescued in Revelation 12 being Harpezo. The dragon morphing into a serpent goes back to Revelation, I'm sorry, the dragon morphing into a serpent goes back to the book of Genesis chapter 3. As we've said, Satan has two modes of attack, the dragon and the serpent, the persecutor and the deceiver. When Herod failed to kill Jesus, he became enraged with the woman and the rest of her offspring, the same as what we see in Revelation 12, as Herod killed the male babies in Bethlehem. That is a type, a picture of what Antichrist will do. We would refer people to our teaching tapes, the Jewish understanding of the nativity and so forth, or the book Shadows of the Beast, or Harpezo. We've dealt with these issues extensively. Again, the same people swallowing this September 23rd crackpot idiocy, and that's what it is, it's crackpot idiocy, are the same people who bought into the Mark Biltz con job of the blood moons when nothing happened. It's just the next nonsense. Now, the danger with things like this is that Christians become diverted and obsessed with it instead of putting the emphasis where scripture does. As we pointed out two weeks ago, something of serious prophetic significance did happen in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount when for the first time in 2,000 years, in two millennia, a minyan, an official Jewish prayer service, took place on the Temple Mount, held by Orthodox Jews during the Islamic protest when they would not ascend the Temple Mount. Bearing in mind that by rabbinic law, halakha, Orthodox Jews are not allowed up there because they erroneously believe the Shekinah to still be present up there which is, of course, not the case. The Shekinah is in the hearts of regenerate believers. What is the reality, however, is there is a provision in halakha, in rabbinic law, for Orthodox Jews to go up there, and that is if they're seeking to rebuild the temple. Adonai <laughs> Adonai im loch leolam ba'et. Kol od ba'lei v'afinima. Adonai im loch leolam ba'et. Kol od ba'lei v'afinima. Nefesh hu di omiya. The only way that those Orthodox Jews who went up there and held the minyan could have been up there is if they did so with a professed purpose of rebuilding the temple. 
We've talked about the Temple Institute, the two yeshivas in Jerusalem dedicated to reviving the Aaronic priesthood and the Levitical sacrificial system. And we spoke about the mitochondrial DNA experiments going on for nearly 20 years now, trying to identify a priestly lineage of Jews with names like Levi, Levinsky, Levy, um, Siegel, Cohen, and so forth. Priestly names, Levitical names. Now that was an event that was important. That is prophetically significant. But that is being under-recognized in favor of a nonsense. This September 23rd foolishness. Please pay no attention to that nonsense, nor to those who propagate it. This week in prophecy, we have the growth of another false prophecy, another nonsense misleading people that will only discredit the church and bring the people of God who pay attention to it up the garden path, just like the blood moon's foolishness did. Let's continue. It is reported in the Israeli press this week in prophecy that there are moves afoot to indict Benjamin Netanyahu for fraud and for accepting bribes. The response has been that this is the Israeli equivalent of what is taking place in the United States. Although James Clapper and although Dianne Feinstein and other, other leading Democrats, even from the Obama administration, active in the world of intelligence or congressional oversight of intelligence, said they have no evidence, there is no evidence of any collusion involving Donald Trump or the Trump campaign with the Russians. None, no real evidence. People are seeking to bring down Donald Trump by legal means, how be it engineered, concocted legal means, because they're unable to do so by political means, having lost the election. This same game is alleged to be now taking place in Israel. Specifically, <clears throat> it has been uncovered that Benjamin Netanyahu is said to have received funding from the Australian billionaire, um, James Packer, and also from the Hollywood producer, uh, Aaron Milchin. This is the allegation. There is no proof thus far that it was any kind of misallocation or misappropriation of political contributions. The Yediot Aharonot newspaper is involved in the investigation. The claim being that the Netanyahu government offered to help Yediot Aharonot against their competitor, Israel Hayom. But again, these things are all being alleged. A former aide to Benjamin Netanyahu, Ari Harrell, who is involved in the leadership of the American Friends of Likud, the Conservative Party of Israel, has been offered immunity from prosecution if he will testify against Mr. Netanyahu. There does appear to be a degree of political motivation in this prosecution. It's like the United States. Barack Obama was caught red-handed by a hot mic talking to a representative of Vladimir Putin saying that when Mr. Obama would be re-elected, he'd have more flexibility in making concessions to Mr. Putin. But there was no investigation, no grand jury, no congressional inquiries into Barack Obama. Uh, let alone talk of impeachment, which there should have been. Barack Obama did things like he cooperated with a terrorist organization, the Muslim Brotherhood. He additionally concluded an illegal treaty unapproved by the Senate with Iran. But again, there was never any legal move against Barack Obama or against Hillary Clinton over her emails, even though even this week in prophecy, more and more evidence is coming out about Huma Abedin, Hillary Clinton's right-hand woman. We shall see what happens in Israel. But the trend seems to be when you lose politically, 
try a legal avenue of recourse, politically motivated investigations and prosecutions. Uh, there has been no real proof brought forward as yet that Mr. Netanyahu took any personal bribes. But watch this space. The Filipino government, backed and supported by the United States, has made gains against radical Islamic terrorist elements, uh, not only Abu Sayyaf, but others in Mindanao and in the Islamic areas of the southern Philippines. What is happening, however, is that Muslim children, Muslim children have been programmed, brainwashed into celebrating these terrorists as some kinds of heroes. Uh, the Philippines has always been a battleground between Christianity and Islam in the South. It has always been that. That has intensified. Despite the fact that the new president of the Philippines is no friend of America, he still draws on American support in his own efforts to contain the growth of radical Islam in the southern Philippines. Uh, he tries to befriend China, despite the fact that China is grabbing islands that are claimed by the Philippines, such as the Paracel Islands and the Gulf of Tonkin and the South China Sea. It is a very confused mess in the Philippines, but we point to the element and factor of Islam. Once again, it is not simply a Middle Eastern phenomenon, but there remains three and a half times as many conflicts in the world involving Islam as all the other religio people groups put together. However, the problem has not only been Islam. There is a growing Buddhist militancy. People in the West have had this na naive idea that Buddhists and Buddhist monks are these peace-loving people. In fact, they can be quite violent, quite militant. There was a history of persecution of Christians in Nepal and in Tibet by Buddhists and by Buddhist monks led by Buddhist monks. Well, this week in Myanmar, that is Burma, a country with an 87% Buddhist population, Christian homes are being burned after a number of Buddhists have put their faith in Jesus. We would again point to the fact that under the former junta, there was a sequestering of all religious freedom and human rights in Burma. If you've watched our videos on the humanitarian crisis in Myanmar, you'll know that Buddhist violence against the Rohingya Muslim minority is a serious problem. Buddhist violence contradicts most people's perceptions of the religion as built on non-violence and pacifism. But with these and other instances of Buddhist aggression, we wanted to know, can Buddhism be violent? One of Buddha's five precepts teaches not to kill or hurt another living being, and historically Buddhists have refused to take part in violent conflicts. Despite this, in countries like Japan, Tibet, and Myanmar, followers of Buddhism have engaged in sectarian violence and oppression. In Japan in the mid-1990s, a doomsday offshoot of Buddhism called Om Shinrikyo was responsible for a deadly chemical weapons attack on the general public. Members of the cult released nerve gas into crowded commuter trains, killing a dozen and injuring hundreds. In feudal Japan, there were also warrior Buddhist monks called the Sohei, whose teachings included the mercy of Buddha should be recompensed even by pounding flesh to pieces. During Tibet's 2008 political unrest against Chinese rule, local reports alleged that 800 Buddhist monks rioted in the streets for independence, killing several civilians. The Chinese government claimed that the Tibetan Buddhist spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, incited the violence and that thousands of pounds of explosives were hidden in Buddhist temples. However, the validity of these claims has been disputed. The ongoing crisis in Myanmar can be attributed to a long-standing history of minority repression. But most recently, in 2013, a Buddhist monk who's been called the Burmese Bin Laden became the well-known spokesperson for the anti-Muslim 969 movement. The group takes its name from the numbered virtues of the Buddha. The Christians, unlike the Muslim population of southern Burma, present no threat to the Burmese or the, the government, or the government of Myanmar, as it is now called, in Ramgun. Yet, we see a move of God among the Buddhists in Burma, in certain localities, 
and the Buddhists are responding with violence. This has taken place in northern India, it's taken place in Nepal, it's taken place in Tibet. People talk about free Tibet and the Dalai Lama as if they're the victims of the Chinese, which may be true. But what they won't tell you is these are not really the gentle, peace-loving people they misrepresent themselves as being. They are quite capable of persecution of Christians. That is this week in prophecy. But let's move on to Israel and to the Middle East this week in prophecy. Hypocrisy of hypocrisies. One of the most notorious critics of Israel, who is a revisionist, who is a misrepresenter of the factual basis of what is really happening in Israel and its relationship with Israeli Arabs and the Arab neighbors Israel has, as well as the Arab population of the West Bank. I speak of none other than Mr. Saeb um, uh, Erechat. Saeb Erechat. He is the most ardent critic of Israel imaginable as the chief negotiator of the Palestinian Authority, and he has been for some years. Well, he is suffering from pulmonary fibrosis. To whom is he turning for medical help, surgery, and the hope of a lung transplant? He's turning to the very Israelis he condemns as violating the rights and human rights of Arab Muslims, which is not true. Arab Muslims, even from Gaza, have been treated free of charge in Israeli hospitals, their lives being saved. Arab Muslims from Lebanon and now refugees from Syria receiving free medical treatment in Israeli hospitals, underreported by the secular media and totally ignored in the so-called Palestinian Arab Muslim media. But now Saeb um, Ereket, chief negotiator of the Palestinian Authority with the Israelis, is going to the Israelis for help the very Israelis, he denounces and decries with false accusations of violating human rights. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you want to see the violation of human rights of Arabs, go to Syria or look at what the Palestinian Arabs did to each other in the war in Gaza or the war they had in Lebanon against their own kind. Palestinian Arab Muslims killing other Palestinian Arab Muslims. The Israelis have never done to them what they have done to each other. This is a common practice. When they're in trouble, they go to the Israelis for help. After an automobile collision, an injured party was in serious trouble in the Razi Palestinian Arab Hospital in Jenin in the West Bank. The family wanted this victim of the accident collision transferred to a Jewish Israeli hospital where he'd have a much better chance of survival and a higher, more professional degree of medical treatment than is available in the West Bank. Now, the reason top medical care is not available in the West Bank is because of the misallocation of the budget and international aid given to the Palestinian Authority, which is being spent on pro-jihad propaganda and the subsidy of, of terrorists, as we'll look at as a moment at a moment, instead of spending it on things like health care, for which it was intended by the donor nations. The Razi Hospital in Janine refused to allow this transfer of the accident victim to an Israeli hospital. However, when Mr. Saeb Ereket is suffering from pulmonary fibrosis, he has no problem getting into an Israeli hospital. This is the reality of what really happens and what is happening this week in prophecy. The chief negotiator of the Palestinian Authority is going to the Israelis for medical help in a dire situation, looking for a lung transplant because Muslim nations are not inviting him and Arab Muslim hospitals cannot give the same quality of surgical or medical care because they are taking the money intended 
to help health care and hospitals and are spending it on hatred and the cause of anti-Israel jihad, directly and indirectly. Let us move on. Coming to the United States now, I have said often there is nothing more pathetic than a left-wing, self-hating Jew. Hi, I'm Ben Shapiro, and this is Reality Check. In 2008, American Jews voted overwhelmingly for Barack Obama. Even though Obama had spent large segments of his prior life hobnobbing with vicious anti-Semites like Jeremiah Wright and Rashid Khalidi, even though he had staffed his campaign with anti-Semites ranging from Shbigniew Brzezinski to Robert Malley, Jews turned out in droves for him. Sarah Silverman harangued young Jews into telling their grandparents that they were racist if they didn't vote for Barack Obama. Jeffrey Goldberg, President Obama's designated court Jew, a role he has never relinquished, informed Jews that they were racist if they feared Obama's positions on Israel. American Jews voted 78% for Barack Obama in 2008. After he was elected, Obama proceeded to undermine Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He forced Netanyahu to humiliate himself before thugs like the Turkish government publicly condemn Israel's defense of itself during the Gaza war against Hamas while funding the Hamas unity government, repeatedly leak vital national security information that would have allowed Israel to strike Iran and sign a deal with Iran that essentially foreclosed any possibility of Western attempts to stop Iran from going nuclear. And so American Jews voted 69% for Barack Obama in 2012. The question I'm most often asked, thanks to my kippa, is why Jews vote leftist? The answer is simple. The vast majority of Jews don't care about Judaism or Israel. They care about secular leftism, which is their actual religion. And the polls show this. American Jews are the least religious religious group in America. Only 41% say that their religion is important to them in their daily life, according to a December 2012 Gallup poll. Only 34% said they attend religious services at least monthly, compared with 65% of Jews who said they attended religious services seldom or never. 22% of Jews say they have no religion. According to an October 2013 Pew poll, just 38% of Jews say their Jewish identity has anything to do with Judaism at all. Just 10% of Jews identify as Orthodox, people who consider themselves fulfilling the commandments of the Torah. As for Israel, just 30% of Jews say they are very attached to Israel. Only 43% of Jews have ever been to Israel. And here's an amazing statistic. Just 40% of Jews believe that God gave Israel to the Jewish people. 27% say God didn't. Another 5% said they didn't know. And 28% said they didn't even believe in God. So, what does being Jewish actually mean to most Jews? Again, according to that Pew poll, 73% of Jews said it was about remembering the Holocaust. It isn't. Just 19% said it was about observing Jewish law. Only 28% said it was about being part of a Jewish community. Jews, in other words, are not religious. They are secular leftists who don't want to be labeled white people because they like being diverse and being able to enjoy the in-jokes at Woody Allen films. So, why is it a surprise that most Jews vote leftist? Most Jews aren't Jewish in any real sense beyond ethnic identification. They have nothing to do with Torah, the five books of Moses. They have nothing to do with the ethical system posited by biblical Judaism. They have nothing to do with the mitzvot, the commandments. They have nothing to do with Israel. Polling Jews on their politics is like polling anyone born Catholic on their politics. You're going to skew far to the left by including lapsed Catholics. And most Jews are lapsed Jews or never knew anything in the first place Jews. The Torah is not a left-wing document. It opposes abortion. It opposes same-sex marriage. It does not believe in a grand welfare system, but in private charity. It dictates belief that Israel was promised to the Jews and that the Jews have a responsibility to live ethically according to a very specific set of behavioral guidelines. Judaism is conservative in the modern parlance. Those who pretend to back both Judaism and left-wing values are betraying Torah Judaism, which is why while Jews vote three to one for Democrats, Orthodox Jews vote nearly two to one for Republicans. Now, there are older Jews who vote leftist because they remember the bad old days of country club Republicans who rejected them from the golf course, and they don't realize that things have changed pretty dramatically. There are older Jews who vote leftist because they remember the legacy of European Christianity that preyed on Jews for centuries, and they don't realize that American Christians are Jews' best friends, not the American left that stands by President Obama. But, by and large, most Jews vote leftist because they are 
upper middle class agnostics with above average levels of postgraduate education who believe that religion is a great ill, that biblical morality is intolerant and vicious, and that Judaism itself is passe. So, bottom line, Jews who care about actual Judaism don't vote leftist. And those who prioritize leftism don't vote Jewish. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel or click here to give a quick donation. Do not ask me to explain it. But major Jewish figures in the Silicon Valley, even people like Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, are philanthropic but contribute to left-wing causes and even anti-Jewish causes naively. Uh, one of which is the Silicon Valley Community Fund with over $8 billion in assets for, for philanthropic distribution. They have been funding CAIR, the Saudi and Emirate-backed Council for American Islamic Relations, three of whose leaders were unindicted co-conspirators in raising funds for terror in the aftermath of September 11th. Uh, and others such Islamic causes, which are pro-radical or pro-jihad. Uh, this includes the sponsorship and endorsement of anti-Semitic, misogenic, and uh, certainly even anti-Western Islamic clerics, such as Hussein uh, Kamal, who justifies sexual slavery. Why are people like Mark Zuckerberg giving money to the Silicon Valley Community Fund without knowing how that money is being spent and to where it's going. It's going to an organization which, in the view of many thinking people, because of the association its leaders have had with Islamic terror and the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, CAIR, why is money going to them? Why is such money going to other Islamic causes when they are associated with radical clerics who preach extremism and do so in the United States with funding from Silicon Valley. It does not make a lot of sense. There have been a number of Jewish entrepreneurs who have come to the rescue of the United States when the manufacturing base were going to countries that had labor intensive lower costs, such as China. Much of the manufacturing base of the United States went to China, went to other countries. It began to shift to Japan, but then to China. And now it's going to other countries in lieu of China. How did the United States remain the number one economic power in the world? Well, America went to high tech. It was companies like Apple, founded by Stephen Job, Oracle was founded by um, Mr. Ellis. It was certainly Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, Microsoft, Bill Gates. Probably about a third of these entrepreneurs, uh, such as the Oracle founder, Mr. Ellis, and uh, certainly Mark Zuckerberg, were Jewish. Now, obviously, Steve uh, Job was not Jewish. Either is Bill Gates. There were certainly absolutely non-Jews involved in the high-tech revolution, but there are certainly Jews who made a disproportionately handsome contribution to giving America control of the new economy uh, as America saw its manufacturing base drift to other countries with lower labor costs. Why would American Jews, who've done so much for this country, uh, have this left-wing orientation? Jeff Bezos is not Jewish, the founder of Amazon, but he owns the left-wing, anti-Trump Washington Post. Why this left-wing orientation? Why? It does not really make all that much sense. Now, Mr. Bezos is not Jewish, however, He's certainly an entrepreneur. 
why would he gravitate towards the party of, of high taxation? Uh, the party that can only hurt his own business interests and his capacity to create jobs and generate tax revenues uh, through productivity instead of by just expropriation of higher taxes. Why are these people doing this? They're not all Jewish by any means. Not Jeff Bezos, certainly um, not the founders of Apple and so forth, but many of them are. And it just does not make a lot of sense. This week in prophecy, however, has seen something else take place. At Brandeis University, Professor Pascal uh, Marot, what is with him? He sees radical Muslims as harmless, essentially seeking liberty from colonialism. This is naive and it is stupid. Such a person should not be, in any event, involved in higher education anyway, because he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Uh, colonialism has nothing to do with it. Even in countries where there's no colonial history as such, at least not in many, many decades, you still have the element of radical Islam. What is happening here? Now, what makes this strange is Brandeis University is largely established and funded by Jewish interests. The pathetic scenario of Jews behaving as if they hate their own people is utterly ridiculous. You are never going to buy the friendship of radical Muslims. When radical Muslims get money from you, they see this as Allah giving them victory in the jihad against you, that even the infidel has to come to them and pay them. They see this as paying the penalty for not being a Muslim. It is a doctrine of their religion. We've talked about this in the past. The infidel has to pay the Muslim because he's not a Muslim. Now, this is not talking about in Islamic countries. This is going on now in the United States and in Western countries. Why? Why are they doing this? Radical Muslims see this as paying the demi. They see it as demitude. They are entitled to be compensated by the non-Muslim as a penalty that the non-Muslim has to pay them as the price of not being a Muslim in order to be allowed to be a non-Muslim. This is demitude. Again, taking place in Western countries. Why are Jewish professors, Jewish philanthropists pandering to this? Why is any Westerner, why is anyone who supports democratic values pandering to it? It makes no sense. It would very much remind us of what was happening in the days of the pre-captivity Hebrew prophets who were warning why are you going the way of the Assyrians? Why are you going the way of the Babylonians? Or in the times of the Maccabees, like with Menelaus, why are you Hellenizing and going the way of our enemies and pandering to them and even joining with them? It makes no sense, but there was a long history of it. And unfortunately, the Jewish people have a long history of it that we can read about in the Hebrew scriptures and in Jewish history, in First and Second Maccabees. Well, it's going on again. Now, we see what happened in biblical times as a result of this suicidal behavior by the Jews. We saw what happened in the days of Ezekiel and in the days of Hosea and Amos. We saw what happened in the time of the Maccabees. It would be foolish, ridiculous, to think the same thing will not happen again when you do the same things, you're going to get the same results. Things don't change historically, even over that many centuries. People are extremely naive, at times stupid. And I say this not gladly, having an Israeli Jewish family, Jews can be as stupid and self-destructive as anyone else. But let's continue this week in prophecy. German economic spokesman of the German Free Democratic Party, Michael Thurer, made a curious and interesting statement, again underreported 
by the mainstream media. What was he saying? He was saying the following. The intimidation of Britain and a almost conspiratorial plan by the European Commission to damage the economy of Britain in order to frighten any other country who would think of a Brexit or leaving the European Union. He said that this will only economically backfire and hurt the European Union. Unfortunately, the European bureaucracy in Brussels, the Eurocrats, are largely socialists. They are parasitic, they live extremely large, they live, uh, a, again, a parasitic lifestyle of salubriance at the expense of the European taxpayers while professing to be socialistic. They don't really have a strong sense of market realities or the realities of what takes place in the capital markets coming out of London, which is still the financial capital of Europe and Britain, of, of, of that side of the Atlantic. By hurting Britain, they're going to hurt themselves. The economies of Europe are increasing trouble. This is particularly true in the banking sector. The British banking sector in London is vital to the other countries in Europe, even post-Brexit. Let's understand what is happening. The danger, among other things, and perhaps the foremost danger, for continental Europe now is non-performing loans. Non-performing loans. It is not only countries like Romania and Bulgaria and Hungary, former communist countries that have underperforming loans of 10 to 20 percent, Croatia being another. It is countries such as Portugal, Italy, and the Republic of Ireland with underperforming loans of 10 to 20 percent. The overall level of underperforming, underperforming loans or non-performing loans, actually non-performing loans in the European Union is 5.1 percent. That is very high. These statistics come from the World Bank. They were released this week in prophecy. The United States only has a 1.3% of loans that are non-performing. Uh, Japan, 1.5%. Europe, 5.1%. And it has reached as high as 5.7%. Cyprus and Greece alone have a 45 to 46% rate of non-performance. That is astronomical, astronomical. And of course, it'll be for the European Central Bank, indirectly the German, primarily the German taxpayers and the European Commission to bail them out and to keep them solvent. Harming Britain and harming the British efforts to leave Europe on mutually beneficial terms in the negotiations for the final Brexit break. While they may be detrimental to Britain, they're going to be more detrimental to continental Europe. At least Michael Thurer has at last told the truth. The others, politically motivated, governed by often self-interest, are not saying anything. But these figures by the World Bank were released this week. They have a tremendously tremendously important and a frightening implication for the global financial system, particularly in continental Europe. Let's continue this week in prophecy. An increasing schism, a rift, is widening between conservative American Roman Catholics, traditional Catholics in the United States, and the left-leaning papacy of Pope Francis from Argentina. Two close confidants of Pope Francis have written articles highly critical of conservative traditional Catholics in the United States. Highly critical. 
it's denouncing them for their support of some of the policies of Donald Trump. It's support. It's condemning them for their alliances on social issues, such as opposing same-sex marriage with conservative evangelicals and others. But it carries the weight of the confidence, being confidants of, of the Pope himself. There is an increasing alienation between the Vatican and American conservative Catholics, most notably the Archbishop Cardinal of Philadelphia, but not only him. Expect this to increase. The Roman Catholic Church is fragmenting. The Atlantic is beginning to separate European Catholicism from the more conservative American Catholicism on certain social issues on which this Pope has been willing to compromise, including homosexuality. Again, this is significant. Now, when the Vatican begins to get in trouble economically or politically or morally, what they generally do is they look for some other issue to divert the attention of the world and of the Catholic constituency. They look for some other issue. Don't be surprised that that issue becomes the Middle East. The Vatican has long tried to play a brokerage role in reconciling Israel with their Arab neighbors. This is not new, but they're going to have to do something. It is the standard way the Vatican does business. Um, with the pedophilia scandals in the United States and elsewhere, what the Roman Catholic Church did was jump on the immigration bandwagon and begin opposing crackdowns on illegal immigrants from Latin America, trying to make it a moral social cause in order to divert attention away from their own immorality of protecting pedophile clergy. The Vatican always plays that way. They divert people by lighting a fire and taking people's attention to the real issue that is at hand. Well, this week in prophecy, the issues are heating up again, and they will continue to heat up, given the fact that you have a pope who has caved in effectively on homosexuality. Here's some breaking news right now. It comes from the papal aircraft. Pope Francis making a significant statement uh, showing conciliation to gay priests and, and gays and lesbians all around the world. Josh, we've just gotten the bulletin from the aircraft. Yeah, again, uh, this is uh, in Pope Francis. This is a man who spent his life in service, and it was thought that perhaps his election was in part because he represented uh, the churches reaching out to the disenfranchised. That has included women and gays, and in speaking for a little over an hour and answering questions with the press corps in Italian, and it says relaxed, often laughing and joking with him, he says, not only will the role of women in the church be more prominent and important, this is also what he had to say, in specific about gay priests, if someone is gay, and I'm quoting, if someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? End quote. This, of course, uh, does fly in the face, really, of his predecessor, Pope Benedict, who had said that men with deep-rooted homosexual tendencies should not be priests. Again, as you mentioned, George, just another sign of conciliation. And you know, this is a growing Francis. sentiment inside the church. Now, there's still opposition in the Catholic clergy to gay marriage, mm -hmm. but I spoke with Cardinal Dolan here in New York uh, several weeks ago, and I said, what would you say to a gay couple that comes to you and says, we love each other, and we, we want to live out that love? He said, I love you too, and God loves you. They're trying to reach out, trying to find ways to include everyone in that church now. But, but the Pope coming out and making those Massive. types of statement, statements like that, and he, we had a kind of an indication from him early on that he was going to be a different type yes. of leader. Yes, and I, I really feel like, again, the church, they realized that they had come to something of a crossroads and that they would have to make uh, gestures such mm -hmm. as these. And again, it's interesting, not only did he say it, but how it was said, again, in very relaxed back and right. forth. And exactly. it comes off that amazing trip media. to Brazil this week where he was strong, just, you know. Oh, like, especially the young all over him, absolutely. Big headline in the moment. Publicly stating that if two men are in a same-sex relationship, who is he to judge? That is what he said. And a number of American Catholics particularly do not like it and do not approve of it. But let's move 
Um, this week in prophecy, there are major efforts afoot to bring new legislation to the United States. One of these is called the Taylor Force Act. Well, a plea this weekend to President Trump to stop the flow of money that goes to the families of terrorists who kill Americans and others. That's right. U.S. taxpayer money, say critics, handed over to Palestinian terrorists and rewarding their relatives. We've told this demand is on the agenda for Wednesday's visit by Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas when he goes to the White House. And the tragic case of one victim of terrorism, an American hero, is on the minds of many. Taylor Force was a West Point graduate who served in Afghanistan and Iraq and was pursuing his MBA at Vanderbilt. His future was bright. Taylor was stabbed to death while he was in Israel by a uh, Palestinian. The 28-year-old was savagely knifed to death as he strolled on a Tel Aviv Ocean boardwalk last year. His killer, a Palestinian terrorist, whose stabbing spree also severely wounded 10 others. All dads, all moms are, are proud of their kids. Uh, Taylor basically did everything right, but he was, he was humble about it. Taylor's parents, Robbie and Stewart, say their grief was compounded by the fact that the family of their son's murderer is making money off Taylor's death. The Palestinian Authority pays jihadists and their survivors who are involved in acts of terrorism money, critics say, that is derived from U.S. funds. A congressional bill named for Taylor called the Taylor Force Act would cut off USA to the Palestinian Authority if it does not stop the payments. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham is the bill's main sponsor. Can you imagine growing up in a country where your government will pay you for killing someone else through a terrorist act? The U.S. gives the Palestinian Authority more than $300 million a year, and the PA reportedly shows out that much to the families, about 7% of its total budget. Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Danan, says the payments must stop. I think nobody, no Israeli or no American, would be happy to know that his taxpayer money is being used to pay for families of terrorism. It's you actually encourage terrorism when you give money to the family of terrorism. Taylor's killer was identified as 22-year-old Bashar Mas Allah, who was shot to death by Israeli police after the attack. His body was given a hero's welcome when it returned to the West Bank. Palestinian U.N. Ambassador Riyad Mansour told us while the PA is against civilians being killed, what he calls the families of martyrs deserve the money. You cannot uh, cherry pick one case here or one case there, that there are, you know, a large number of Palestinians who are receiving uh, compensation. They are victims of Israeli terrorism. Taylor's parents hope the bill would discourage acts of terrorism. And it's so important that the Taylor Act, Force Act passes so that other sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, aren't lost in this way, no matter what. The terrorist, it's, uh, we Just never thought loss. that we would be in this position, so we want to reach out to people. Well, Senator Graham says President Trump will sign the Taylor Force Act if it lands on his desk. But so far, passage remains uncertain. That's because, as of right now, not one Democrat in Congress supports it. But the bill supporters hope that soon will change as more people consider the cause of Taylor Force and so many others like him. That would st stop the United States from giving economic aid to the West Bank and Gaza as long as they continue paying jihadists and terrorists for attacks against Americans and Israelis. This is highlighted repeatedly by the Israelis. We now know this week in prophecy, the figures that have been produced before the American Congress, now publicly disclosed, the Palestinian Authority designates half of its budget, half of its budget, that is half of the financial aid given to it by the United States and other countries to rewarding Islamic terrorists and their families. 
to paying financial incentives to radical Islamics and their families if they're killed in suicide attacks and the like. Half their budget goes to the de facto rewarding of acts of terror, of murder, half. And that's coming from the pockets of the American taxpayer. Congress has had enough. And there are sympathies within the Bush administration to stop this. It was already raised by Jared Kushner. It was raised by President Trump himself. But now Congress is addressing the issue. When you think half of the international aid given to the Palestinian Authority, that should be going to hospitals, schools, and infrastructure, is instead going to reward acts of violent terror and murder. And Western governments and taxpayers in countries like the United States are expected to provide the money. If I told you that Palestinian terrorists receive a governmental monthly salary and that that salary is much more than the average salary of a Palestinian worker, you would probably think I was crazy. But this is exactly what is happening. The Palestinian Authority is funneling annually hundreds of millions of dollars to terrorists and to their families. In 2016, that amount came to $300 million, according to figures available in the Palestinian Authority public budget. The PA institutionalized sponsoring terror against Israel, with approximately 7% of their annual budget allocated to the cause of rewarding terrorism. How does one get a pay raise in this system? The longer you spend in prison, the more you are paid. In other words, the worse the crime, the more the cash. These payments reflect the Palestinian attitude towards Zionism. In their view, the struggle against Zionism is the essence of being a Palestinian. And therefore, every way of fighting Zionism is justified. The law, according to which these payments are made, refers to these convicted terrorists as the fighting sector within the Palestinian society. Not only are these payments illegal under international law and contradict the Oslo Accords, but they are fundamentally immoral. Yet foreign aid from Western nations and organizations continue pouring in to the Palestinian Authority. Donors ignore this uncomfortable reality because they are worried that opposing the Palestinian Authority in its practice of paying for terrorism will further radicalize Palestinians. But the opposite is true. Palestinians perceive this readiness to turn a blind eye to funding terrorism as a green light to continue terror and education in hate. This constitutes the major obstacle to peace. And in order to overcome it, the international community must demand an end to these payments. It's about time for Congress and the administration to say no. This must end. This week in prophecy, the issue has been brought up and is now in the form of legislation being proposed before Congress. Let us hope and pray that it succeeds and let us hope and pray that President Trump signs it. We need to stop funding the Palestinian Authority. It is urgent. It is vital. Now, part of the reason they do it is because they're in competition with Hamas. Hamas being a terrorist organization aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood. Something needs to take place. All of these things are taking place this week in prophecy. We see what's happening in Israel with the threats of indictment of Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, the Rosh Hashanah. We see what's happening with Saeb uh, Rekat, the Chief Palestinian Authority negotiator with the Israelis, going to the Israelis for medical and surgical help with his pulmonary fibrosis, while other Palestinian Arabs are not allowed to do so. We see what is happening in Congress now in response to the misallocation and misappropriation of financial aid given to the Palestinian Authority being diverted to rewarding people for committing acts of 
jihadist, radical Islamic terror. In Europe, again, we see somebody finally telling the truth about Brexit. There's an effort by the Euro socialists to intimidate other countries in the European Union not to follow Britain's example. But this has every potential of backfiring against the EU nations themselves. This week in prophecy, the World Bank has disclosed the figures of non-performing and underperforming loans. Again, countries that were once thought to be Western and relatively stable, Ireland, Italy, and Portugal, as well as the countries formerly on back of the Iron Curtain, such as Bulgaria and Romania and Hungary. 5.1% non-performance of loans in continental Europe and the EU countries. What a situation. It can't continue this way. None of these things can continue this way. There'll be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. But what we do know is this, there is a spiritual battle. What we see happening in North Korea as they continue to test weapons and missiles capable of reaching the United States, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Again, that was this week in prophecy, the Trump administration scrambling to respond, even calling for new economic action against China, partially induced by China's refusal to pressure North Korea to cease its actions on the Korean Peninsula. Wars and rumors of wars. Iran, much the same. The conflict within the Sunni world, not just Shia versus Sunni, but now Sunni versus Sunni and the Saudi Arabian led dispute with Qatar, home of Al Jazeera. Fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. How are they going to get out? Well, they're not going to get out. The Antichrist will offer solutions, but it will all turn out to be a huge double cross. It's amazing to see these things happening and the stage being set for the very things predicted by the Hebrew prophet Daniel. Well, again, the United States and Great Britain to a degree are having a period of limited respite. We urge our listeners to continue to pray for Mr. Trump. No, I'm not completely satisfied with him, but he is consistently appointing more conservative judges who are constitutionalists. Let's pray they don't turn out to be their traitors as other Republican judges appointed by Ronald Reagan and the Bush family have been. I'm disappointed in certain aspects of Mr. Trump's policies thus far, but he's under tremendous pressure and tremendous attack, including from the uh, rhinocrats, the Democrats in his own party who sit on the wrong side of the aisle. The Mormon, Jeff Flakey, Senator of Arizona, being one who's leading the charge. John McCain being another. Obviously, Susan Collins from Maine being another still. Let us remember that the Democrat Party and its left-wing leanings, and people like Chuck Schumer and others like Nancy Pelosi, they are no better, no better than the Bush loyalists in the Republican Party. They are no better than Jeff Flakey or, or, or Susan Collins. Susan Collins is not pro-life. They do not share any kind of moral values aspired to by the evangelical support base that brought Mr. Trump and Mr. Pence to office. The battle rages. What we see happening in the corridors of power in America and Britain are a reflection of the conflicts taking place in the heavenlies. Please continue to pray for Mr. Trump. 
And we would urge our friends in Great Britain and elsewhere to pray that God removes Theresa May. Great Britain needs and deserves a Brexit prime minister who is a conservative, not a hypocrite uh, and a loser. This is very serious. There are moves afoot led by Tony Blair to try to reverse Brexit. That must not be allowed to happen. Whatever the political efforts people make to preserve the democratic will of the people in Britain or America, the most important issue is always going to be the prayer of God's people. All of these things this week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Rash speaking to you from Wellington, New Zealand. God bless. Speak to you next week. Please avail yourselves of the Bible teaching and expository material on Moriel TV. God bless.